Hi everyone, I'm Kyung Lee. Uh, I'm going to talk about our recent work on metaphysical learning, uh, which is learning to forget for meta learning. Uh, we know that uh, the standard supervised learning paradigm requires a large amount of data uh, for uh, each particular task. While future learning uh, aims to learn a new task uh, under a few data regime, uh, in order to achieve uh, such goal, meta learning tackles the problem by learning prior knowledge shared among tasks, which is then used to quickly adapt to each new task with a only a few label examples. Meta learning algorithms can be uh, broadly classified into metric based, model based, and optimization based, depending on how prior knowledge is formulated and how prior knowledge is used for adaptation to each task. I will focus on the optimization based method. Among optimization-based approaches, a model agnostic meta-learning, in short, MAML, has gained a lot of attention from diverse uh, domains uh, for its simplicity and generalizability. MAML formulates prior knowledge as a learnable initialization that is shared across tasks. Uh, from the learned initialization, model is fine-tuned to each task with a fixed number of steps and learning rates to achieve a task-specific model. However, we questioned whether the shared and fixed initialization is the best starting point for learning diverse tasks when tasks are different from each other in several aspects, such as difficulty. Thus, we first analyze what kind of uh, problems occur when several tasks share a learnable initialization during training. Uh, starting from the uh, current values of initialization, model is fine-tuned to a given task using support set. The generalization performance of resulting task-specific model is measured on new query examples of a given task which is then used to calculate the gradient for the initial initialization uh, such that uh, generalization on this task is maximized. Then a similar procedure is performed to calculate the gradient for the initialization uh, to maximize the generaliz generalization to another task. Finally, a gradient uh, from several tasks are gathered to update the initialization. As you just saw, the good initialization location is mostly likely uh, different for each task. Thus, when the gradients are gathered from tasks to update initialization, the resulting initialization may not be desirable uh, to any of the tasks. If you look at more extreme but possible case, where gradients from different tasks point in opposite directions. The gap between the desirable and resulting initialization location becomes large. We name uh, this gap as gradient conflict. Through analysis on conflicts, we observe that the degree of conflict are largely differs among layers. In particular, Deeper layers seem to have a large degree of conflict, while shallower layers have a smaller degree of conflict. This analysis is consistent with well-known observation from prior work, where they show lower layers learn general representation, while deeper layers encode uh, task-specific features. We also observe that the degree of conflict differs among tasks, implying each task has different degree of preference of the initialization. Upon these observations, we propose a novel learning to forget scheme called L2F that forgets a part of initialization that conflicts with the learning of each task. This can be done by attenuating the initialization by gamma here. 
Considering how the degree of conflict differs among layers, we aim to control the amount of attenuation or forgetting for each layer L. Similarly, we also desire to control attenuation parameters for each task I. To this end, we introduce a meta network, GPI, that generates task and layer-wise attenuation parameters. GPI is conditioned on layer-wise mean of gradient to obtain a task and layer-wise information. GPI is a simple three-layer MLP with a sigmoid activation function at the end to ensure attenuation parameters are between 0 and 1. Here, uh, we, show L, we show L to F mechanisms in animation. Uh, from the shared initial, initialization, we use support examples uh, to compute uh, test embedding. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, gradient uh, tau i. Uh, GPI then uses this test embedding to generate attenuation parameter gamma i. Uh, the generated gamma i is then used to attenuate the in initialization zeta. After attenuation, the fine-tuning process afterwards uh, is the same as the other uh, general optimization-based meta-learning framework. The training of meta-network pi i is the same as the training of initialization, where pi i parameters are updated uh, such that uh, generalization on noble query examples is maximized. Uh, in future learning, uh, algorithms are often evaluated on uh, future classification, uh, cross-domain future classification, and uh, future regression problems. Uh, in standard one-shot and five-shot classification benchmarks, uh, such as uh, mini image net and uh, tired image net, not only L2F greatly improves the performance of MAML, uh, L2F is also shown to improve the SOTA method, uh, LEO. Uh, L2F, L2F also demonstrates a substantial uh, performance improvement in challenging uh, cross-domain future classification. In this case, uh, the training is on, uh, done on a mini image net and the test is done on a COB data set. Uh, in even uh, future regression, regression problem, uh, L2F greatly improves MAML and outperforms other baselines. Uh, as, may, as many of you know, have noticed, uh, future learning algorithms are only evaluated on simple problems. Uh, to further stress the uh, generalizability and uh, uh, effectiveness of, of our proposed method L2F, we perform experiment on more practical problems, uh, such as video frame interpolation and visual tracking. Uh, when applying meta learning to video frame interpolation, L2F is shown to better adapt to diverse scenes and show better interpolation result compared to MAML. Uh, similarly, when applying meta learning to visual tracking, uh, L2F is shown to greatly outperform MAML and other baselines. All in all, uh, we introduced uh, the gradient conflict phenomenon uh, that occurs when sharing uh, initialization in one of the most widely used algorithms. MAML. Uh, upon analysis, we proposed a learning to forget framework, L2F, that is facilitated by attenuation. We showed that uh, the proposed method achieved high performance and can be applied to diverse uh, domains. The proposed L2F is a flexible uh, plugin module, so it can be applied to any optimization based met meta learning method. Okay, uh, this work has been uh, work with uh, my student, uh, Song Young Baek, uh, Jung Hoon Ao Oh, and uh, uh, So Gil Hong. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everyone. This is Hang from Visual Computing Group of MSA. In this presentation, I will talk about our works on how to adapt pre training and fine tuning paradigm for small data regulation. Let me begin with a story about ImNet. ImNet challenge has played an important role in triggering the deep learning era in computer vision. 
In 2012, there is a deep, deep end work named AnnexNet, which won championship of that year's challenge. With the error rate reduced by an amazing 40% compared to the last year's champion entry. This is a milestone moment, indicating the coming of a new deep learning era for command vision. However, this is not the only milestone moment. Please look at this illustration. This is a curve indicating the percentage of papers which include the word deep in the title. After Alex Knight, DEEP began to be included in computer vision papers. However, we also noticed that there was a big jump at the year 2014. So what is this new milestone moment? Let me post the answer. The milestone moment is caused by a new paradigm named pre-training and fine-tuning. Unlike ImageNet 1000 dataset, which has more than 1 million images, many computer vision tasks don't have enough data to train a good deep model from scratch. For example, semantic segmentation, object detection, and fine-grained classification. We call them medium-scale problems. In 2014, researchers found that a pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm can well address this this dilemma, that the deep networks are firstly pre-trained on the large ImageNet 1000 image classification task, and then fine-tuned on the medium-scale problem. This paradigm significantly increased the prevalence of deep learning appro approaches. Concretely, there are two stages. The first stage is to pre-train a backbone network using large amount of pre-training data. In the second stage, the pre-trained weights in the pre-training stage are used to initialize weights of the backbone network of the done same task. So how about this pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm for regulation of very small data? For example, less than a thousand examples. There are two related topics about small data regulation. The first one is semi-supervised learning. Uh, please see this illustration. In this topic, there are uh, a few labeled images, for example, uh, two cat images and two dog images. There are also large amount of unlabeled images. The goal is to well recognize cats and dogs. For a long time, the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm was seldomly invested probably due to difficulty in getting a meaningful pre-trained model. Later, we will show that pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm is also powerful for this problem, significantly better than other methods. The second topic is field short learning. In, the, in this topic, we have many samples for base classes and a few samples for level classes. The goal is to transfer knowledge from base classes to level classes. The main difficulty lies in the domain gap between pre-training and fine-tuning. Later, we will show that the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm needs levitation to perform well. Now, let's see how we apply the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm for semi supervised learning. Here is our framework. The adaptations from the standard pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm are two folds. Firstly, in the pre-training stage, we use self-supervised pre-training instead of supervised pre-training. By using self-supervised pre-training, we can leverage a large amount of, of unlabeled data for training. Secondly, to have also enough training data for the downstream fine-tuning stage, we propose a label propagation approach. By these two adaptations, we release the power of the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm for semi supervised learning. Uh, please see the right plot. The x-axis shows the number of labeled samples. The y-axis shows the uh, test top one accuracy. Our approach is absolutely 27% higher than the previous best approaches. In the following slides, 
I will introduce these two key designs. The first key design is self-supervised pre-training. In self-supervised learning, although we can leverage the small amount of labor data for model training, its performance is poor due to too few driven signals. Our proposal is to leverage huge unlabeled data for pre-training. So can self-supervised learning perform good enough for model pre-training? Our answer is yes. We tried two methods. The first method is named canonization. The input is a grid image, and the task is to convert this grid image to a color image. The second method is named instance discrimination. This method treats each single image as a class and training the model by an instance calculation task. The second key design is an additional label propagation step to enrich labeled images for fine tuning. Firstly, we build a similarity graph between labeled data and unlabeled data using the similarity between their pre trained features. Secondly, we propagate existing labels from the left to the right, and all the right images will be assigned to the labels, which are used in, in the following fine tuning stage. We conduct a ablation study for these two key designs. The green curve shows the results of training from scratch. The blue curve shows the results by using self-supervised pre-training. It has absolutely 15% uh, improvements when the number of labeled images is as small as 500. The red curve shows the results by further using a label propagation step. We obtain another about absolutely 20% improvements when the number of labeled images is as small as 100. It also performs strong on ImageNet, ImageNet 1000 dataset. With 1% labeled images for each category, the top five accuracy is improved by more than absolutely uh, 35%. Next, we adapt the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm for future learning. While well, there have been a lot of existing methods for future learning, a paper on SAIR 2019 demonstrated that the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm performs very competitive, as shown in this table. Since then, the pre-training and fine-tuning method becomes mainstream for future learning. However, does better pre-training results in better future accuracy? Uh, we studied this problem by using margin in pre-training. In general, positive margin will improve the pre-training performance. For example, in this illustration, using a 0 0.2 margin value can make different classes distribute more distant from each other. This is an experiment using more margin values. Increased margin values can help improve the discriminative power on base classes as shown by the right curve. However, they will harm net power on level classes as shown by the blue curve. As shown in the right figure, the one-shot and the final-shot accuracies are both improved by about uh, four points and three points respectively. On three benchmarks of future learning, we all achieved significant improvements over previous best approaches about five point points on mini internet, about two points on cube, and about seven points on mini internet to cube. Here is a summary of the talk. We try to adapt the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm for regulation of very small data. We first adapt this paradigm for semi-space learning, uh, where there is no enough label data to train a good model. Our solution is to leverage self-space learning, which is powerful. We then adapt this paradigm for future learning, uh, where there are domain gaps between pre-training and fine-tuning. We found that lacking margins matter in pre-training. This is the end of my talk. Thank you for your listening. Hi, everyone. My name is Zhe. I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft. Today, I'm very happy to introduce our uh, recent work on how much can GPT-3 benefit a few short visual reasoning. Um, as we all know now, large-scale language model pre-training has become a central uh, training paradigm for NLP. Uh, parameter counts are frequently measured in billions rather than millions. For example, the OpenAI uh, GPT-3, they have uh, uh, 175 billion parameters. 
Um, an interesting phenomenon is that when the language model is scaled up, it really can demonstrate very strong few shot performance. So that is uh, without any parameter update. When you only feed a few in context examples, and then the model can adapt the new task very quickly. So as you can see in this plot on the popular supergroup benchmark uh, for language understanding, the GPT-3 model by OpenAI can demonstrate very strong um, few shot performance. Um, so since GPT-3 is a language model by itself, so it can naturally benefit um, uh, so pure NLP problem. But then how about uh, the multi-model tasks? So the question that we are going to ask in this talk is, uh, can GPT-3 also benefit visual reasoning task? And we are going to use the VQA task uh, to illustrate um, uh, uh, the visual reasoning. So basically, uh, given an input image and a question, and an AI system need to uh, predict the answer. So uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about a very challenging VQA uh, benchmark called the uh, OK VQA. So in this benchmark, the model needs to use external knowledge, not in the image, in order to uh, correctly answer the question. If you can see uh, the example here, given the input image, if you ask a question, what sort of vehicle uses this item, uh, the model needs to first recognize what's the item inside the image and then to retrieve the knowledge to solve the task. Um, previous methods basically use a two-step approach. Uh, they will first perform knowledge retrieval and then perform knowledge reasoning. Uh, so basically all these methods, they will use explicit and structured knowledge bases, such as ConceptNet and also the Wikipedia. Um, however, this can be problematic. Uh, first, the retrieval the knowledge might be uh, very noisy and irrelevant to the question. Second, the re-embedded knowledge features during reasoning might be very different from their uh, original meaning in the knowledge source. So, uh, in this talk, I'm going to introduce PICA, uh, which is uh, short for uh, prompting GPT-3 while the use of image captions. So, the key idea here is that we are going to use the pretrained GPT-3 as an implicit and unstructured knowledge base. So uh, this is a very simple approach, but very surprisingly, we find only using four shoots, just using four training examples, this can outperform supervised SOTA using the whole training data set. Then, um, how do we achieve this? Um, since GPT-3 cannot understand the image, right? So it's a pure language model. Uh, so we uh, translate images into textual descriptions, specifically uh, image captions or image tags that GPT-3 can understand. Then we will create uh, this kind of uh, prompt. Uh, so includes the prompt head and the few in-context examples. And then the frozen GPT-3 model will just uh, produce the answer in an open-ended text generation manner. Um, uh, so, so even just uh, this very simple approach can already surpass the, the SOTA performance. But then how can we uh, better enhance the performance? We have uh, two strategies. Uh, for one, we design uh, in-context uh, uh, example selection. So basically, we are not going to use a random example, but uh, we try to select better examples based on some metrics, such as the uh, question and the image similarity, uh, with the input uh, text example. So as you can see here, given the input image, and uh, uh, so the question is, when was this type of translation invented? If we do not do uh, in-context example selection, the prompt, uh, constructed prompt can be kind of noisy, right? But then when you use the question and the input image as the uh, 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 as the tool to select a better in-context examples, uh, the, uh, the constructed prompt is much closer to the input test example. And we believe uh, this will benefit uh, the few shot performance. Uh, the second approach is the multi-query ensemble. Basically, we want to merge predictions from multiple queries with different examples. It's a kind of doing ensemble. Um, 
So now I want to discuss briefly about our uh, so uh, so results. The sort of approach, uh, basically using all kinds of knowledge sources, Wikipedia, ConceptNet, Google, uh, so images, they only have uh, suboptimal performance. And here our pickup base without using uh, in context selection and multi query ensemble already surpassed the SOTA. And the pickup uh, 4 can further boost the performance. And we also find both captions and the text are useful for GPT 3 prompting. Um, you may also curious how many shoots are enough. Uh, here we show uh, four shoots can already uh, be SOTA. And then uh, typically, if you use more uh, in-context examples, this will lead to better performance. And finally, uh, uh, Frozen is another very recent method by DeepMind that also performs multimodal few short learning. And our PICA can outperform Frozen by a significant margin. Um, uh, then why? Uh, why GPT-3 are so powerful on OKVQA? We believe there are at least two reasons. First is the GPT-3 model, they have encoded a very rich uh, factual knowledge. So if you say the first two examples, given basically the same question, when was this type of transportation invented? Actually, it's a very challenging question, right? Because you need to predict the exact year this uh, transportation was invented. But GPT-3 can do this due to the rich uh, factual knowledge encoded. Um, this is in another case. Uh, where can you get this? And then uh, the GPT-3 encodes common sense knowledge and now uh, the answer should be glossary store since the context uh, includes shopping car and the bananas. We can also let the GPT-3 to just generate answer uh, so rationales. So basically we add in another pump. This is because and then let the model to generate the, uh, the answer uh, so rationales by, uh, by itself. Um, so, so interestingly, for example, still the, the example I used just now, this is because glossary store is the most common place to get food. So kind of GPT-3 also knows how to uh, produce the right answer. So I'm going to uh, quickly summarize the work here. Is, uh, we uh, are the first one to study how to use GPT-3 for multimodal tasks. And with very few in-context examples, GPT-3 can surpass the supervised SOTA by a, a very significant margin. Uh, but then you may also wonder what's the limitation here. Indeed, there are many, uh, um, several obvious limitations. Uh, so basically, it's uh, due to we convert images into captions. So this will uh, lose important visual information. And in order to verify this, we test the pillar on VQA V2 with questions on very detailed visual contents. And as we can see from the results, indeed, uh, the performance are uh, lagging behind the supervised SOTA, though, uh, so it is uh, still better than the frozen method. So kind of to let you have a better sense of how it works. Uh, uh, so for example, for the cases, G uh, GPT-3 uh, GPT can work. So due to uh, the GPT-3 has encoded the knowledge and due to the generated image captions, uh, so it's very related to your question. And it can be some reasonable guess here. But then for some failure cases, indeed, for example here, when you ask how many giraffes are there, there are, so this will be very challenging for the model to predict due to you just do not have the detailed visual information, uh, but just a simple caption. So, uh, so looking back, uh, so, so I think Microsoft has been a very important player in the vision language pre-training space. There are many exciting works has been uh, produced, such as United, Oscar, Vila, WinVL, and so on. But then, really looking forward, when can we have the GPT-3 moment for the VLP model? And then uh, this is our future direction. So uh, by the end, I'd like to thank the collaborators, and uh, thank you for your time.